presenter is um, Bobby Kim, who is a neurosurgery resident. He's been with us for a couple of weeks, and he's going to be doing, as we usually recommend, a uh, surgically oriented neuroophthalmic presentation patient that um, he saw with uh, Dr. Degree. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bobby Kim, one of the first year residents from neurosurgery. Uh, this morning, I'm going to talk about vision loss after pituitary tumor resection through the uh, transphenomenal approach. So PK uh, is a 43-year-old male who presented with progressive left eye vision loss over two years and new right eye photosensitivity. Uh, approximately two years ago, um, his uh, vision problem started off as difficulty with distance vision in his left eye. Uh, and six months ago, he was diagnosed with myopia and astigmatism, but his left eye vision was unable to be corrected. Uh, at that time, his visual acuity was 20 out of 30 in the left eye and 20 out of 15 on the right. And uh, approximately a month ago, uh, he could only see shape, movement, and light in left eye, but he couldn't, dis uh, he couldn't see distinct features uh, except temporally with this left eye. And uh, about a week prior to his presentation, he started developing photosensitivity in his right eye as well. Um, he, didn't have, he didn't have any double vision, uh, no painful eye movements. Uh, or flashing lights or halos. Uh, his past medical history was not significant with the exception of LASIK surgery in 2001 and uh, trauma to his left face in 2011, but there was no ocular injury. Uh, so these are his eye exams on his initial presentation um, at the clinic. Uh, his visual acuity on the right eye was 20 out of 15, uh, but his left eye, he was only counting fingers of face temporally. He had an APD on the left uh, and his visual field exam. Um, on the right, he had superior temporal field defect um, as well as a little bit of uh, inferior uh, temporal field deficit as well. Um, on the left, he, has, he had a nasal centrosecal scotoma. And on OCT, he has some inferior thickening on the right eye and on the left, he has some temporal atrophy. So these are his images. Um, so concerning for uh, space occupying mass lesion, uh, MRI of the brain and orbit were ordered, uh, which showed cystic peripheral enhancing lesion in the cella, uh, which was likely either Rathke cleft, cleft cyst or cystic pituitary macroadenoma. Um, it had some mass effect on the optic chiasm and prechiasmatic optic nerves greater on the left than right uh, with associated signal abnormality of the left optic nerve. So this is the, um, the coronal post-contrast image showing the uh, about two centimeter macro adenoma or, or pituitary tumor at this point, uh, kind of having a compressive effect on the chiasm. And this is the stir image. And if you look closely, there's some signal abnormality in the pre-chiasmatic uh, optic nerve on the left. And this goes all the way to, your, uh, to involve the anterior portion of the optic nerve. So based on his uh, symptoms and the, the image findings, this was consistent with junctional scotoma, uh, which is a uh, scotoma in the ipsilateral eye and uh, superior quadrantinopia in the contralateral eye. Uh, you can get these symptoms by um, compression of the, um, the structure called Nia Wilbrand, uh, which is basically a loop of inferior nasal fiber that crosses the chiasm and uh, uh, travels up the contralateral optic nerve for a short distance before traveling in the optic tract. So um, any pituitary tumor or mass lesion uh, that's compressing on the inferior portion of the prechiasm can produce uh, something like junctional scotoma. So referral was made to neurosurgery. Um, so at the um, time of initial evaluation, he didn't have any gynecomastia, uh, no heat or cold intolerance, no change in libido. Uh, on exam, he was neurologically intact, except for his vision. <coughs> so a uh, patient uh, underwent TSRPT, which stands for transphenoidal resection of pituitary tumor, with fat and fascia graft packing. Uh, those are done to prevent CSF leak. Post-operatively, uh, the path came back as non-secreting cystic pituitary macroadenoma. Uh, he was in compensated DI, but in general, he was doing fine uh, clinically. Uh, Post-op, his right eye vision worsened, actually, uh, especially with the colors. He quoted that 
blue and red are more neon. Uh, he also had more photophobia. And he was discharged home on post day three. So on his follow-up visit, um, his visual acuity in his right eye actually worsened uh, significantly. Uh, on he the right eye... He was scared out of his gourd. <laughs> right? What's that? Right? I'm sorry? He was scared out of his gourd. Right? That yeah. increased vision in the right eye. Possibly. I've, 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 I've had some of these patients go through, and including one who was a neurosurgeon <clears throat> who was going through this. Mm. I was getting calls five times a day. Is my good eye going to go? This is just... <laughs> Everybody recognized these are the patients who really need handholding because this is this is scary stuff. You've got one eye that's that's you've lost vision and now your good eye started to be impacted. This this is um, this is real gut wrench. Oh, he seemed pretty stoic to me at the time. He was like, yeah, uh, my right eye is getting stoic worse. To the neurosurgeon, but I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so his visual acuity on the right eye was 20 out of 100 compared to 20 out of 15. Uh, he was still counting fingers at face temporally. Uh, his color vision on the right eye was basically zero. His HRR test was zero out of three and zero out of six. And on the fundus exam, uh, per note, it looked a little full, question mark. Uh, maybe slight blush. It still had inferior thickening. Uh, so concerning uh, for what's going on in there, uh, another brain uh, MRI was ordered uh, that showed increased signal abnormality in the chiasm. This stuff, all this stuff right here is fat packing with fascia. And then there's still a signal abnormality in the left prechiasmatic optic nerve. Left optic nerve, there's still signal abnormality. And there's new signal abnormality in maybe right optic nerve as well. And again, all this stuff is fat. So uh, we were concerned for a uh, compressive effect um, on the chiasm from the fat graft. So a patient was readmitted to the hospital uh, for return to OR for fat graft removal. Uh, he did fine. Uh, from my conversation with the, the fellow who was involved in the uh, case, uh, he didn't believe that um, the fat packing was any more uh, significant than all of the other pituitary surgeries that it was involved in. Um, on post-op day one, however, his uh, right eye visual acuity still worsened. Uh, he was 20 out of 400 on the left right eye, and was still counting fingers on the left eye. On post-op day three, his acuity got maybe a little better, or was stable. It was 20 out of 200 to 400 on the right eye, uh, and counting fingers on the left eye. And uh, during this time, Dr. Degree has been seeing the patient pretty much every day. Um, his, he was discharged home on post update three, and uh, per Dr. Degree, we started actually neurology, uh, started him on, on IV methyl prednisolone, uh, one gram for three days on post update four, five, and six. But my understanding was that he didn't have any um, improvement in his, in his vision even after high dose steroid. Uh, so these are his exams um, on the follow up visit. His visual acuity, yeah, I didn't see him, but uh, visual acuity was 20 out of 400, which is uh, far worse than his pr uh, prior two visits. Still counting fingers to face temporally. Uh, his fundus exam showed uh, nasal haziness and temple paler um, on his uh, fundus. And this is the, basically uh, his progression of the right eye visual field. Uh, initially involving uh, superior quadrant, upper quadrant here, but then kind of globally involving his visual field, uh, sparing his inferior nasal quadrant there. Uh, additional labs were ordered to rule out any um, autoimmune or uh, other etiologies, uh, which were basically all normal and negative. Uh, his oligoclonal band was negative. His LP, his opening pressure was pretty much normal, and he had normal CSF profile. Uh, so I did some list search to um, gather more information on the incidence of uh, worsening visual outcome after pituitary surgery and to um, identify any uh, risk factors, uh, both uh, preoperative, intraoperative, uh, that are associated with worsening uh, vision outcomes after pituitary surgery. Um, so in this um, 
paper which evaluated visual outcome in 2,000 eyes following uh, TSRPT. 90% uh, of the patients had a macroadenoma, 97% uh, of which underwent TSRPT. And immediately post-op, uh, visual acuity and visual field improved in only 16.3% uh, and worsened in 3.6% of the patients. But in one year post-op, uh, visual acuity and visual field improved in 93% of the patients, uh, remained static in 5.2 and worsened in 1.3%. Uh, so most of these patients do pretty well and their visual acuity and visual field uh, improve uh, to some extent uh, up to one year post-op. And some of the risk factors that were associated with uh, poor visual outcome was long-standing symptoms, uh, patients who had uh, visual symptoms for more than a year, and complete optic atrophy on exam. Uh, those were kind of uh, prognosticated, uh, prognosticated factors for uh, poor visual outcome. And shorter duration of visual deficit predicted better outcome. And uh, and this paper that was published in the Journal of Neurosurgery, um, they looked at 79 patients and uh, they predicted the type of tumor that uh, predicted the visual outcome. Um, it was shown that patients with pituitary tumors had the greatest improvement, followed by craniopharyngioma and meningiomas. And interestingly, uh, no improvement in vision was seen in patients with epidermal tumors, choroidoma, or Ewing sarcoma. So type of tumor is also important. But all of these uh, papers and literature sort of um, describe whether the vision improves, remains static, or worsens. Um, none of the papers really delved into the mechanisms uh, that, may, uh, that may be behind all of these uh, vision loss. Um, so this is an old paper that was published in 1990 uh, from a group in Emory. Uh, it was a case series describing 11 patients, but they were pretty, um, they were sort of trying to come up with uh, predictive factors for vision loss and uh, potential risk factors. Um, so, I lost the screen here. Uh, so factors uh, that may cause postoperative vision loss, uh, they thought it was, these are all uh, uh, real life experience from their surgeries. Um, direct injury to the optic nerves, and or chiasm uh, during tumor removal or uh, devascularization of, of the optic nerve chiasm uh, from the adherent tumor removal, and this is uh, especially uh, apparent in uh, reoperation or uh, patients uh, who have history of radiation to that area. Uh, also compression from postoperative hematoma, uh, packing of the cell with too much fat or muscle or direct damage to the optic nerves. Um, that comes from fracture of the optic foramen from rigorous retraction. Uh, also prolapse of the optic nerves and chiasm into the empty cella can happen if, the, if it's a giant uh, macroadenoma that just kind of falls into the empty cella. And very rarely, uh, patients develop cerebral vasospasm, spasm, um, which are of course associated with other neurological symptoms. And um, the potential risk factors that they identified that may predict the likelihood of uh, visual complications were uh, presence of macroadenoma versus micro, uh, pre having visual impairment preoperatively, uh, weird shaped tumors that look like bottleneck or dumbbell, uh, or history of previous surgery, radiation therapy, um, and use of an intraoperative lumbar uh, subarachnoid catheter, which we don't do here. Um, it's sort of used to manipulate the um, the stock up and down um, to get a better resection. Um, so with respect to fat pack, um, I found one paper uh, that described two patients who had visual loss after um, uh, transphenoidal surgery that was likely secondary to fat packing. Um, after fat packing removal, one patient had total visual recovery right away, and the other patient, um, he's persistently had chiasmal compression, um, either from intracellular fat or residual tumor. So in conclusion, uh, post-TSRPT vision loss is a rare but serious complication. Uh, immediate post-operative evaluation of vision and neurological status uh, are important and they can direct further management. 
uh, and can lead you down different pathways, imaging, uh, taking the op patient back to the operating room, uh, starting the patient on high-dose steroid, et cetera. Uh, most common causes of immediate post-PSRPT vision loss were uh, supracellular hematoma, direct damage to the optic apparatus, devascularization of the chiasm, uh, overpacking or fracture of the foramen. Uh, and whether, whether or not the immediate postoperative vision loss after pituitary surgery improves in long term is unknown. I, I couldn't find anything. Did he get better? Yep. What's, what happened? He was seen in the tomorrow. clinic, but I don't know what happened uh, to him. I see him tomorrow. I've been following him like daily in the hospital and then uh, every week. So I'll see him tomorrow. Is he stoic with you or is he I know scared? he's not stoic. He's, he's scared very frightening to him. Um, the, uh, the things about this case that are weird, I mean, we see a lot of pituitary tumors here, and his, his, his presentation was so classic with that, you know, central scotoma, high in the sky, it's just like what we teach in textbooks. And usually you do the surgery and everything is great. And he had great OCTs before surgery, so I was very hopeful that he would do very, very well. Um, and then, uh, Immediately afterwards, when his vision was going down in the right eye, the radiologist read the scan and showed compression from the fat pack. And I know neurosurgery didn't think that it was that much fat pack, but because of that, uh, Dr. Caldwell did recommend taking um, the, some of the fat out so that it wasn't compressing it so much. And then um, the thing that's disturbing to me is that he's got, it looks like uh, demyelination, uh, in the, the chiasm and in the nerve. And uh, we are working him up for labors, hereditary optic neuropathy. I thought he had a negative MO antibody, but we're working him up for labors. Uh, could he have had ticks and fleas? You know, two things that would give him two optic neuropathies. But um, we'll, we'll keep you posted. He's, uh, he's a very nice guy. Um, and uh, But it's good that we have other resources here at Moran to help with this post type of visual loss. It's not common. I've never seen anybody have this much trouble after transfer transferable type of hypothectomy. So uh, uh, having had a, both a neighbor and a friend who's also a neurosurgeon who went through this, and Dr. Green knows exactly what I'm talking about, uh, and, and was very stoic to neurosurgery. It's good for neurosurgery to hear this. Scared out of his gourd calling me five times a day. <laughs> Uh, and, and he got worse after, and he and I had a long debate, I and mean, this is a, a very well-known neurosurgeon who, who ended up with a good recovery. No, he, no, that one. The yeah. big debate we had on him is that, is that uh, uh, is his feeling is, is that uh, in, our, in, in the desire to make sure that we just don't have CSF leaks chronically, which are a big problem, <coughs> is that uh, uh, we are uh, potentially now overpacking the fat uh, in, in and that there, there's more of, of this. And, and his sense, as he reviewed, is that there are more who, who are starting to get worse for a while before they get better. And I just, I'm just, I don't claim to be an expert, but I know he and I talked about that. And he, he admitted that it had not been looked at carefully. So is that somebody go to neurosurgery? I mean, that's a, that's a good question to ask. How much is too much? And uh, uh, is our outcome in trying to be 100% certain we don't have CSF leak, maybe resulting in, in uh, compressive damage that, that otherwise could be avoided. Because he said he didn't think that has been well addressed it has nor been. answered in any decent study. No. Would you agree with that? Totally. I've, I've looked at this literature now twice with him and with this guy both. Um, you know, the first one, we did not do anything. We just waited it out. And he did great. Uh, he did just, he did great. But um, well, this, he, but he got a lot of gray hairs. Oh, yeah. He did get some gray hairs. There, there was a lot of hand holding, but it all worked out. But That's one, an important question to answer. Yeah. It would be great to know. Um, the problem is, I think you can see from the literature, it's very rare. And so uh, how the much... The numbers would be able to... Uh, it's, it's extraordinarily rare. I mean, I've, I've seen a patient with this. It's, it's very, very rare. Um, I, I think that uh, there's a lot of variability in the anatomy, uh, especially the vascular anatomy, yeah. which is not something that is ever evaluated preoperatively. Uh, but I think that what's most interesting about this is that his vision loss progressed after the surgery. 
It wasn't like he just woke up from the surgery with terrible vision. His vision actually worsened after Almost the surgery. Like some process got exactly. And I think that that's why the extensive evaluation. So hopefully things will improve. Thank you very much.